And uh, then if you get done a little bit early, if your parents don't know where to find them, you'll find them in the gym most likely is where they will be if they finish before we do. Well, today we are going to continue on in John 13, so if you have a Bible, feel free to grab that, dig that out. If you've got an iPad or Android or whatever, you version is a good way to go. There are some in the lower parts of the chairs. There's also Bibles on the Welcome Center. You're welcome to grab those, and if you don't own a Bible, take that Bible home with you. That's a gift from us to you, and we want to bless you with that and put the Word of God in your hands and make it available to you at all times. So uh, take one of those Bibles. We will buy more. It's our joy to give those away. But John 13, the second half of John 13, starting in verse 21, is where we're going to spend our time today. And today, as we jump into this, uh, we join Jesus again in the upper room, and, and as we follow the Word and the actions of Jesus in these, what turns out to be the, the, the final hours before he is arrested, before he is uh, to be taken, to be, to be tried and then crucified, um, we saw earlier in the first part of chapter 13 um, that he has just predicted, uh, he has just prophesied this, this betrayal of Judas and this denial of of Peter, that Peter is going to deny him, that Judas is going to betray him. Two of these inner circle guys, two of these disciples of his, these these men who had been so close to him, had been following him along, had been studying and learning at his feet for now uh, the better part of three years, uh, two of these guys uh, are going to fail him. And, and in that sense, it's, it's not surprising then, though, coming from Jesus, that the, the, the next words that he would say would be, let not your heart be troubled. So let's hear the words of God. Let's dig in. Let's jump in at uh, John 13, 21. And I'm going to read on through verse uh, 38, the rest of John 13 there. And you will see it on the screens if you want to follow along as well. And there it reads, After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some had thought that because Judas had the money bags, Jesus was telling him, Buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Verse 31 when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of God, or now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also be glorified in him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, Where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Amen. 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going now? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you, you, will, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay my life down for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay your life down for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Now this all comes on the heels of the context is that we've learned last week. It comes right on the heels of of this foot washing that Jesus did for the disciples. Um, He's in the upper room and And as we dig in here, we're in the closing chapters of John's Gospel. 
Um, if you haven't noticed before, as you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the bulk of the Gospels are devoted to this last week of the life of Jesus. Um, and, and, and this, of course, is, is peculiar to the Gospels. It's what distinguishes the Gospels from the, the other uh, books of the New Testament. It's what distinguishes the Gospels from other simple biographies, for that matter. Um, John himself here devotes nearly half of his entire book, half of the entire book of John, is, is devoted and dedicated to roughly, give or take, um, the last five hours of Jesus' life. Uh, one commentator, as I mentioned last week, says that Matthew, Mark, and Luke show us Christ's body, but John shows us Christ's soul. And in a sense, in this passage and in this portion of Scripture, Jesus is revealing to us um, something of his soul, something of his inner self. And he, he gives to us a, a glimpse of the fellowship that he has had for all of time, this fellowship that he's had with God the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And he, and he speaks of him going away and then coming and going and giving the Holy Spirit and all these kinds of things. And, and, and all of it in the context of this ongoing loving relationship within the Trinity. And here in John 13, um, he begins to unfold something of, of great significance. Um, something of what Jesus is doing and the events that are beginning to transpire that are kind of kicked off here in this upper room. These events that are leading us to the cross as we head towards Easter, towards the cross of Calvary. Revealing something, something of, of Jesus' innermost glory. This glory that can be seen as we study the scriptures, as we look through the different stories and the passages of how God has interacted with God's self all through the Old Testament and on into the New Testament. We see this, and it it gets more clear here now as Jesus is heading towards the cross. And did you catch what he said in, in verse 31 and 32 when he speaks of the relationship that he has with God the Father? That, that the Father's relationship with him, that there's something special there, and now there's something that's transpiring here in this, this, this upper room that, that, that indeed reflects and reveals and manifests something of the essence of the, the glory, not only of just the human Jesus, but of the divine Jesus. That, that fully begins to, you know, we've seen a lot of his humanity, and now it's really reveal, revealing some of his divinity in this moment. And it says, now is the Son of Man glorified, right? God the Father is glorified in the Son, in something that's happening to the Son in these hours. And the Father is glorified, and Jesus is glorified. The Son is glorified in the Father, the Father and the Son. Again, it's this whole thing with the Trinity that, that when one is glorified, the other is glorified. When the other is glorified, the other is glorified. I mean, on and on and on. And, and as you study the Trinity and as you dig into these things, it can kind of almost make your head swim a little bit. But, but all this is to simply reaffirm those core fundamental beliefs that we have as, as Christ followers, that Jesus is fully, truly, completely, and entirely and wonderfully man and God simultaneously. And, and it shows us something of the, the very essence of, of who Jesus was and, and something of the very essence of who God is as we study these things. It, it shows us in, in a rich and wonderful and beautiful way. It, it reveals this to us. What's transpiring here in the upper room should bring us into a place of understanding that, that while we are heading towards a point in the story where Jesus is going to be distanced and separated from God, yet simultaneously as that story is being shown and told to us, we see indeed how intimately close he is with Father God. And so we see this as Jesus begins to unfold in his obedience, that, that as he goes to the cross and does and takes upon him the, the task that's been set before him, as he takes on the suffering servant role, um, as he does those things, it continues to, to magnify the glory of God and put that at the forefront and put it on display for us. So as we read this chapter, uh, we kind of begin on some of the darkness, right? Some of the, the darkness that we, we see and experience during this Easter season. Um, it, it's kind of an astonishing thing, in fact. Um, there's some real darkness in this closing portion of, of John 13 with the prediction of Judas's betrayal, with, with the prediction of 
Peter's denial. Uh, but in that darkness still shines the glory of God. And that's the, the, the astonishing thing that I want you to catch today. That, that something of the very essence of God is being displayed here. Love is being displayed here. Love is at work in this story. In this place here in the upper room where Jesus is with the guys, in the betrayal, in the denial, that the love of God, the love of Jesus, the love of the Father for the Son, the love of the Son for the Father, the love of God for us sinners, that love is actually being displayed despite the darkness that we see. God's glory shines forth in this story in a truly amazing way. As I mention that, I'm reminded of a, a quote from Augustine that he once said that he, he, he says as he reads in Scripture, and, and I see it in this passage in particular, but Augustine said, I see the depths, but I can't see the bottom, right? Uh, it's a good way, I, I like that phrase when I think about reading the Bible, when I think about reading the Scripture. Even I as a pastor, right? I went to seminary, I got four years of studying under, under some brilliant Bible instructors who showed me all kinds of things I could have never seen on my own out of the Bible, right? And, and equipped me with tools to study the Bible. But even with all the tools I have, and I have wonderful computer software, and I got, you go know, to my office, I got a whole wall of books about, you know, the Bible and about reading and, and, and learning and growing spiritually and all those kinds of things. But despite all that, and despite all the resources, and despite four years of study, I really relate to what Augustine says. I, I can see the depths as I dig into the Word of God. But man, I can't find the bottom of it, right? It's kind of like one of our, our lakes here in Minnesota. You know, you, you can look into it, and some of our lakes are super clear. You know, we, we've got some wonderful local lakes that are wonderfully clear. And even in some of those, you can see down pretty far. In Lone Lake, of course, you can see the bottom. That's kind of a special lake. But, but even in the, most of the lakes that are pretty clear... You can see a ways down, but then it starts to get kind of murky because you get deeper and deeper. And that's kind of how I feel like when I read the Bible, right? I study the Bible. It's like the first little part, I'm like, ooh, I'm really getting it. But I eventually, I reach a point as I keep digging. It's like, ooh, there's a lot more here than I was expecting. And, and that's kind of what I get as I, as I read through the stories in the Bible. There's, there's mysteries. There's incomprehensibilities. There's things that keep me from seeing to the very bottom. But despite that, despite my inability to know all of it, and none of us ever will know all of it, but despite that, the brightness of the glory of God is, is, is shining forth in the midst of all of that. And it shines forth, forth especially brightly today because it's portrayed against the, the shadows of betrayal. It's portrayed against the darkness of, of the denial of Peter. And then it's brought together by John in the closing of, of chapter 13 here so that we might see the very heart of Jesus. And in his heart, love resides. It might be worth considering um, these two stories of, of Judas and Peter uh, as separate stories. And you've probably heard sermons in your past, possibly, of talking about one or, or talking about the other. But I think that John put these together in this passage so that we would think about both men together simultaneously. I, I think that John has intentionally written the scripture as he did instead of separating each story out, but instead putting them together here line by line so that we might examine them in context with one another rather than separately from one another. And I think John wants us to ask some questions. I think one of the questions John wants us to ask is, how can we be sure that we aren't Judas? And how can we be sure that we aren't Peter? And in the, of the two, of course, which one is more dangerous to be? Is it Judas or is it Peter? And so I think John is kind of forcing us to a place as we read this passage and read these stories that, that forces us to think about this, to consider this. And, and hopefully, maybe to be a little concerned, am I possibly Judas or am I possibly Peter? And to have that right fear that comes from that concern, but also within that, hopefully, then to find some encouragement out of it. 
So what I want to do is take each one of these stories one at a time, and then we'll kind of come back to them together here at the very end. So first of all, um, let's look at Jesus and Judas. Look first at that section beginning in, in, in verse 17, where he begins to speak. He says, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, that you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one that sends, or whoever receives the one I send, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. And then he begins to say, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you is going to betray me. Now, someone among this inner circle, one of these guys, and they don't know who at this point, Someone is going to let him down in a big, big way. Someone who Jesus had hand-selected, right? This group includes the names of guys like Peter and John and Andrew and James. It includes Judas. He was one of the twelve as well. And so Jesus had hadn't picked these guys, and he's, he's now saying that one of these guys, one of you guys, one of my inner circle, you're going to flame out, you're going to bomb out, you're going to fail me in a stupendous way. And again, they didn't know who, but there had to be concern. You remember, there's other stories, you know, of them kind of jostling for position, of, of hanging out with Jesus. Who, who's your favorite, Jesus? Right? You know, the, well, when you hear those kinds of things, you begin to wonder, well, who's your least favorite, Jesus? Which one of us is going to betray you? You know, some talk kind of going on and wondering what was going to happen to him. And Jesus had been working with these guys for now like, like three years. These guys had been along and seen him preach. They'd seen him teach. They'd seen him perform miracles. Uh, they'd seen mighty works. They'd seen all the signs that we've been talking about as we work our way through the book of John. They'd seen them. Judas had seen them, of course. And then now at the beginning of chapter 13, Jesus gets down on the floor, takes, out his, or takes off his... <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me. He takes off his outer garment, gets a bowl of water, wraps a towel around himself, and he gets down and he washes Judas's feet, right? He knew what was coming, but he loved Judas enough, even knowing the betrayal was coming, to get down and to wash his feet anyhow. And, and I think inwardly, Judas knows what's happening. Judas at this point already has the steps in place. The mechanism has started. He knows he's going to be betraying Jesus, right? And I can only imagine as Jesus gets down to love him and to serve him that it probably burns him a little bit, right? You ever, you ever, you know that passage that talks about heaping coals on your enemy's head, right? Like, like, love your enemies, the Bible tells us. What happens when you love somebody who's angry with you? More often than not, they get more angry, right? Like, like, like somebody's being mean to you, and then you're kind to them. They're like, did they not just see I was being a jerk to them? Now I'm going to be even more of a jerk, right? And, and, and I almost think that as we study Judas in this moment, he's, he's got to just kind of be almost seething on the inside, boiling, going, oh man, I can't wait. This guy is he's crawling around on the floor. This is beneath him, this is beneath me, but whatever. Fine, wash my feet. You know, And he sits there silently and, and, and probably despising every minute of it. Because see, the thing is that Judas's heart had long since begun to grow estranged from the love and ministry of Jesus. And that's precisely why Jesus forewarns his disciples. He, he, he's, he's warned them so that they would be prepared for this. He says in verse 18 that this event would take place so that scripture might be fulfilled. That even though Judas was going to betray him, that this was actually part of the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. And that points us to the fact that, that God is indeed in control. That, that God knows what is happening, 
And nothing is happening that he doesn't see and that he's not in some way in control of. That, that, that no darkness, that no betrayal, that, that no act of treachery can take God by surprise. So you see, God transcends the constraints of time. And even this act of betrayal that Judas has planned is already known to him. Nothing takes God by surprise. He knows the end from the beginning. And he already knows, even before it happens, that this dark deed is coming. And then notice in verse 19, he says, I'm telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you might believe that I am he. And this event, not just the miracles and the signs and wonders that we've been studying, even, even in this darkness of this offense, offensive event, that it, it, will, it will manifest something of the identity of Jesus Christ. This is so that, he says, so that you might believe that I am he. That's that I am thing that, that Jesus was getting in trouble for saying that. They were accusing him of blaspheming. You can't say you're God, that you are the I am. And again, he's, he's saying, I am, that I am he. And in the foretelling of this dark deed, he's saying, because of this, by me telling you ahead of time that this is happening, when you reflect back on it, it's going to help you understand and believe that I truly was and am and will and continue will be God. And then look at verse 21. Uh, it says, after saying these things, it says, Jesus was troubled in spirit. Those are, frankly, fairly astonishing words. I mean, here is the Son of God, right? Here is the divine Messiah. Here is the servant of the Lord. Here is the very Son of God, the Son of Man. And he is troubled in spirit. And I think in this moment, the disciples could see this change in Jesus' mood, right? John makes note of this. And this is pointing us to the fact that, that Jesus experienced life just as we do. Jesus experienced the same passions and the same pains that we do. He was tempted at every point just like we are. Darkness and treachery troubled him, and betrayment troubled him as well. See, Jesus, our Savior, is not some, some distant thing, so, some aloof God, but instead it's telling us that Jesus experienced life like we do, that he walked the earth as we walk it, that he understands deeply and intimately our pain, our sorrow, our trials, and our sufferings. Because he's gone through what we go through. And it's a rare occasion, but... But Jesus' soul here can, can be read in his face. John notes his deep-seated agitation, the, the unsettling of his spirit, that, that as our, our Lord thinks about the depths of human betrayal, as he experiences the darkness of, of Judas's soul and Judas's betrayal, that as he goes through this, knowing that this is the signal of the beginning of the end, so to speak, because he knew his time had come, it said that last week, that this event, troubled as he was for Judas, troubled as he was because uh, this is one of the things that's setting into motion, what will lead to his death and crucifixion, he's troubled, he's agitated, his soul is burdened. And that hopefully helps make Jesus more relatable and understandable for us. Have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever experienced pain uh, in a relationship, in a friendship? Well, so has Jesus. And he knows your pain. He can relate to what you have gone through because he has walked it there before you at a level that you never will probably achieve. His betrayal leads to his death and crucifixion. Most of us will never 
you get to that level, I suspect. Look at the words at the end of verse 30. It says, when, when Judas has received this piece of bread, he goes out. And it says, it was night. Now maybe it was just a, a casual noting by John, you know, saying, oh, well, it's the evening, it was dark outside. If you looked out the window, you could see that. But maybe John here is making a deeper spiritual comment about the fact uh, that Judas' soul was now dark. Maybe John is saying something more significant than just that the sun had set. That there was darkness in Judas's soul. Because no longer did the light shine there. Because no longer was the love for Jesus in Judas. That whatever that sin was had begun to strangle him. And it was choking the very life out of Judas, even though he didn't know it in that moment. And so John records, and it was night. And there are all kinds of lessons for this in us, for, for us today. I think one of the lessons that we can see in this story, particularly about Judas, is that, that what appears on the outside can be very different than what's going on on the inside. Now don't think for a moment that if you were in the upper room at this time, when Jesus had given these, this information out, that you would have looked around and said, oh yeah, I know who it is, right? I know which one of us is going to betray Jesus. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's going to be Judas. I've always had my eye on him. Yeah. He's always looked a little shady. And I've quite trusted Judas, right? No. The disciples had no idea which one it was going to be. They didn't know because outwardly, externally, Judas's profession of faith, that he was following the Savior, was exactly on par with all of these other men. Now, if you've read the book of John, you've seen in a couple of places where he's mentioned, particularly back in John 6, he says that Judas was a thief, right? But he says this in hindsight, because John writes his book decades following the death of Jesus. But in the moment, sitting there in the upper room that night, they had no idea who was the one that was going to betray Jesus. And there's a very simple lesson here for us. That there are things we are devoted to in our heart. Things that are sometimes other than Jesus. Idols that get into our heart. Judas was devoted to money. Judas was devoted to the things of this world. You recall how he had cried out, remember, when, when the, the perfume was, was, was poured upon Jesus. And he says, oh my goodness, right? That money could have been given to the poor or given to me. Put it in my money bag so I can take a little bit of it, right? He doesn't actually say that, but we know that's the things that he was doing. There are things going on in our hearts, each and every one of us. Idolatry, sin, brokenness, the gunk. There's things going on in all of us that if lying unconfessed, if we aren't working against them, they will ultimately destroy us, just as this did to Judas. You can't get closer to Jesus than Judas, right? But if you're not dealing with what's going on on the inside, proximity doesn't matter. Let's look at Jesus and Peter now. For Peter, there's another prophecy in verse 38. It says, I say to you that the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Now, as this is going on, there's kind of a, a change in the atmosphere of this room, right? 
They're in the upper room. They've gathered together to celebrate. It's the Passover supper. This is one of the high points of the spiritual life of the Jews. You're coming together and having a meal to celebrate in remembrance of the great things that God has done for you, right? There should be a a, a great time where everybody's come into the city, into Jerusalem. All kinds of amazing things are happening. People are having fun. You're seeing friends you haven't seen for maybe a year. You're, You're coming together. It's a festival. It's a celebration. It's a remembrance. It's a blessing. It's all of these kinds of things. And all of a sudden, you got like Debbie Downer Jesus coming and rolling in with this heavy, heavy stuff. Like, somebody's going to betray me, somebody's going to die me. Like, we were here for a party, Jesus. What's going on? And so Judas' story comes in and kind of weighs down with this darkness and this foreboding inevitability that, that kind of sucks the wind out of the room, right? When he starts talking about. Some one of you guys is going to deny me. And so then he gets to Peter and he says, or one, one of you guys is going to betray me. And then he gets to Peter and says, you're going to deny me. But the good news in this story is what he says to Peter doesn't end there, but is surrounded by bright lights of promise. The promise of repentance and the promise of renewal. I can almost imagine that night in the upper room. You've got, they're just sitting around, they're eating and they're drinking, and Jesus starts saying these things, right? And, and as, as I read to you earlier, it talks about John. It doesn't say that it's John, but it's the, the one that Jesus loved, the one who was close to Jesus. And Peter pokes him and says, Hey, lean over and ask Jesus who is this going to be, right? It's John. John's like, Hey, Jesus, which one of us is denying you, right? Kind of whispering. whoever I give this bread to. And even that, they don't notice it would appear. They don't seem to notice what happens. But in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of the the sadness of this story, even in the midst of that, Jesus shines the light of hope. In verse 36, he says, where I'm going, you can't follow me. Kind of this darkness has entered in. He says, Peter, you can't follow me where I'm going to. There's a place I'm going. And, and they've been with him. You have to understand. They're, they're thinking like, we've gone everywhere with you, Jesus, right? Where could you go that we can't go? We, we've spent three years following you. Where you sleep, we sleep. Where you eat, we eat. Where you bathe, we bathe. That's what we do. Where your guys, where your posse. Where are you going that, 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 that we can't go? And then he says, you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, what? Huh? They just don't understand, right? But this very same Peter, who is the one who does deny Jesus, we're going to see in just a little bit in the book of Acts, if you read a little bit further, the amazing thing God does to transform him. This Peter who... Who, who when somebody recognizes him, he's like, no, I wasn't with Jesus, that's not me. Just shortly thereafter, is boldly and broadly proclaiming the gospel in, in Jerusalem. Standing there, just shouting at the top of his lungs, preaching to anybody who would hear. And of course we know that the, 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 the Holy Spirit takes that voice under the wind, and then, that people then, even though they don't speak the language, understand fully what it was that Peter was saying. That God is going to turn this, this, this weak need, scaredy cat of a disciple, into one of the luminaries of the faith. That's the amazingness of our God. He takes our mess and our sin and our brokenness, our fear and our failures, and then He can take that and turn it into something grand and something great. Peter, if you don't know, church history tells us that Peter was crucified upside down on a road outside of Rome. Why was Peter crucified upside down? Because Peter said when they went to crucify him, no, don't put me up like Jesus. I'm not worthy to be like Jesus. Hang me upside down. What a radical transformation from the one who denies knowing him three times 
to being the guy that says, crucify me upside down if you're going to do it. That's the amazingness of our God. So what is the difference in the story then between Peter and Judas? I mean, Judas has already left this upper room. He's out to collect his, his 30 pieces of silver because he's going to you know, come up and give Jesus a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? And the, the guards are going to grab him and arrest him. So what's the difference between Judas and Peter? Because... They walked the same paths, they studied the same stories, they learned from Jesus all at the same time. What is the difference between these two men? And then, which one of them are we? Because we're either a Judas or we're a Peter. You see, Judas never felt the pangs of guilt. Judas never felt bad for what he had done to Jesus. He had plenty of remorse, of course. He, he feels so bad about what he did that he would go on to go out and hang himself. But he didn't feel bad for what he had done to Jesus. And at the end of the day, that's the only difference between them. That Peter, in his denial of Jesus, in his catastrophic failure, cries bitter tears of repentance. He knew he had let Jesus down. There was one heart that was indifferent. And then there was one heart that was broken. Judas was indifferent because he cared about himself. Peter was broken because he cared about the failure of his sins. And I think, as I said to begin with, John is highlighting these two so that we see them and con we compare and we can contrast one against the other. Because I think John is telling us either we are a Judas or we are a Peter. That either we are outwardly looking good, but inwardly we're a junky mess, or we're a mess and we're ready to admit it. That's the difference between these two men. And let me be abundantly clear, we don't want to be like Judas. Judas is like a carton of spoiled milk, right? You pick up that carton, it looks great, right? I don't know about you, but I've made this mistake before. You ever just chugged? How many, how many swallows before you figured out that it was no longer any good? It usually takes me a couple, and then all of a sudden you're like, hold on a second here, something went wrong. This is a mistake. Stop swallowing. Right? But then, it's in you. It's too late. But that's what it's like. Judas is like that carton of milk. He looks good on the outside. He's been sitting in the fridge doing the right thing, looking the part. But inwardly, he's spoiled. Peter, on the other hand, is a mess. Right? But Peter goes, yeah, I am a mess. And I can't fix the spoilage. And he repents. And he goes to Jesus. Even though Peter failed in a catastrophic way, God could go on to use him to do amazing things for his glory. And hear this. However horrible, however disastrous, however catastrophic your sins might be, however public your sins might be, however full of shame that you might be for some of the things that you've done in your past, for whatever sins you may have committed, Jesus still loves you anyhow. And He keeps on loving you. Despite your sins, despite your weakness, despite the fact that you keep on failing. That is the good news of the gospel. Not that you are perfect, you're not. Not that you can clean yourself up, you can't. Not that you are better than some people, which you're not, again, sorry. But that Jesus is greater than all of that. His love is greater. His grace for you and me is greater. And it always will be. 
that's the scandal of God's grace. That's the amazingness of the gospel. That's the good news that we find in Jesus that we are leading to in celebration towards Easter. The difference between Judas and Peter was simply repentance. And we get all of us a chance to have all of this love that Jesus offers if we simply do just as Peter does. If you haven't done that before, I would encourage you to do it today. Every one of us is either Judas or Peter, but we get to decide where we're going to fall on that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank